Hi, my name is Jen Fetweiss. I'm from Virginia Commonwealth University in the departments of microbiology and immunology and obstetrics and gynecology. And today I'm going to talk about multi-omic approaches for the study of vaginal microbial communities. So as many of you know, there are microbes living all over our bodies tiny microorganisms that live in ecosystems and form communities. However, until relatively recently, we knew very little about how these organisms collaborate in communities and impact our health. So the, the different um, ecosystems of the body, the oral, the skin, the gastrointestinal, the, the urogenital regions, all have very different landscapes. And up until recently, we were focused very much on the bad organisms, the pathogens that potentially could cause disease. However, relatively recently, new technologies have made it possible to study these organisms in their communities without, without cultivating them. And that's, it, it's really changed the paradigms for how we can think about the study of the microbes or the human microbiome. So I became involved in this work as part of the Human Microbiome Project um, that began back in 2007. Um, there were two phases of this project. The first phase of the project was, pro was the Human Microbiome Project Phase 1. And that was really one of the first large-scale efforts to look at who are the microorganisms that live on our bodies? What are, the, what are they? Who is there? Um, and I was also involved in a study that was part of the, the latest phase of the Human Microbiome Project that is known as both the NIH the microbiome project or sometimes as the human microbiome project phase two or HMP2. And in that phase, moving past the, the, the surveys of who is actually there and looking at how do these microbial communities interact with each other and with the human host over time. And in that study, we're moving past just, just markers of what organisms are there into what we call multi-omic science. And so that includes a lot of different omics technologies. Some of these you may have heard before. So 16S surveys, and I'll, I'll go into that in just a, a bit of depth in a moment, uh, gives us a way to survey what organisms are present in the community. Um, metagenomics is all of the genes of all of the organisms. So if we take a swab sample, I study the vaginal microbiome. So if we take a swab sample and we extract the DNA, we have human DNA there, we have viral DNA, we have DNA from yeast, we have DNA from bacteria. And if we sequence that, we can look at all of the genes from all of the organisms. And as you can imagine, there are lots of different kinds of things that can be done with that sorts of data. And then we can go to metatranscriptomics. So as you remember from molecular biology, in DNA goes makes RNA, and that's really what's functional. So in this case, you, rather than just what is present or what is the predicted function of these communities, we can actually look at what these communities are doing at a given time. And further, um, if we go through, we can look at the, the, the metaproteome or all of the proteins uh, from a particular sample. So that could be human proteins, bacterial proteins, viral proteins, all of these uh, in a sample to try to understand uh, things at that level. And then further, the, metab the metabolites. So what are these organisms producing? What are, what are the host cells producing? And then integrate all of these omics uh, together to really try to get a fuller picture of what's happening um, between the, the, the microbial communities and their human host. Recently, the work from the HMP2 project, which is also known as the Integrative Human Microbiome Project, was published in a series of, of manuscripts that were in Nature, Nature Medicine, and other Nature Family Journals. Um, I was part of the group from Virginia Commonwealth University that focused on the pregnancy and preterm birth. Um, there were two other groups. One was focused on inflammatory bowel disease and the other on prediabetes. And so you might think, well, these, these conditions seem to not have much in common, um, with the exception that they're all conditions that um, where host microbiome interactions are, are quite important. But what really brought these projects together were the types of data and the types of analyses that were common across all of these looking at host microbiome interactions with a longitudinal component. So looking at how that is impacted over time. So all of these resources are now available. I've included um, links later in the presentation. And so if any of you were involved in method development or have other interests to reuse this data, these were generated as a community resource and they're now available to the community. So again, as the project director for the 
project at VCU, which we called the Multi-Omic Microbiome Study Pregnancy Initiative, or MOMS PI. We enrolled um, a cohort in, in uh, Virginia, um, also collaborated with um, a group at the Global Alliance to Prevent Prematurity and Stillbirth um, in Washington State. And we also collaborated with a group at the Medical College of South Carolina. Um, our initial analyses focused on a cohort of women, specifically um, a group of 45 women who delivered spontaneously preterm and matched controls. So I, will, um, I won't focus too much on the results of that from this paper because I'd like to go through and use this as an opportunity to really talk about the, the methods and what's possible for you to do no matter what your system is. Um, but I will go through and just introduce that so that as I go through and talk about that throughout, um, you'll have a sense of, of, what, of why we were doing this part of the study. There are different paradigms um, for health in terms of different microbial communities. Many of you, if you're familiar with the microbiome, may be familiar with the paradigms of the idea of the forest or the rain, uh, the forest being a, a good analogy for what is optimal health for the gut. And the idea is different species come together and they all provide different functions, and all of those functions are important to health. And the paradigm for the vaginal environment is really quite a bit different. Um, although there are different ways to be healthy and we see differences across different populations, I would say the classic paradigm is that typically one species, often one of lactobacillus, tends to dominate and keep other organisms, other anaerobic organisms out of the environment. And one of the things I think that's really important when we think about using this as a model system is that this, the system is, is a bit more simple. And so when we start looking at how do we go through and try to look at multiomic methods and how do we go through and really understand that, the system is, is really one that I think is quite ideal for doing this. So just as the paradigms of optimal health are different between the gut and the, and the human vagina, um, so are the paradigms of imbalance. So in, in the gut, we often think of what functionality has been wiped out and how to restore that. Um, in the vaginal environment, it's often a matter of what are the less favorable species that are present that may impact risk for things such as pregnancy complications, including preterm birth. Uh, we're certainly interested in mechanisms of ascending infection up into the upper female reproductive tract. Um, and also for acquisition of sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV. And so it's become appreciated with the vaginal microbiome that there is a role both in preterm birth and HIV acquisition. And I think that's quite important for understanding some of the health disparities that exist globally for both of these conditions. So if we see here, these are just um, the global rates of preterm birth and the global incidence of HIV. And you can see here that they're, they're really quite, um, there are differences that um, exist globally and there, there are some similarities there. And one of the things that um, my group is really interested in exploring is whether the vaginal microbiome may actually play a causative role in some of these similarities in terms of global health disparities. Um, most of my work has been focused on pregnancy and preterm birth, and these um, were published in the, the Nature and Nature Medicine publications that I referred to a bit earlier, and I will refer to, to some of those throughout. So before I kind of get into the weeds and talk about some of the specifics on the multi-omic microbiome methods, I want to just um, take kind of a the 10,000 foot view and think about what are the challenges as we're moving forward. And I think that's something that's, that's quite important because um, at the end of this place where we've, we've really gone through and we're looking at how multi-omic science has evolved relatively rapidly, there are challenges at the discovery front about how do we push the methods, the technologies, the approaches that we can use to really assay things that we've never assayed before. And then some of the technologies that are becoming a bit mature, there are different types of challenges that are really important for how do we understand the bias? How do we make sure that studies are reproducible? How do we go through and make sure that we can harmonize against um, across studies that are, that are done across different populations as we move towards evidence-based medicine? So I mentioned this, this paradigm before with the Human Microbiome Project, that there was really a move from who is there, surveying communities, to understanding what they're doing and how they're interacting with their host over time. And I think we can think about that through some of the omics technologies as well. 
So I'll start with the 16S rRNA surveys, which is one of the most commonly used methods in microbiome science to assay communities. It's not the only one, but it's, it's perhaps the most common. And then we'll go through some of the other omics assays, which are really starting to push the frontiers. I think the 16S ribosomal surveys are a really good example of one where a lot of really good methods already exist, but there's still opportunities. But I think those opportunities are ones where we're really looking to go through and push the forefront of reproducibility and starting to think about how we can go through and make sure that things that we're doing in these cases are, are um, we have proper control set up, we understand bias, um, and the studies are going to be to be reproducible. So you might ask, why are we using the 16S gene to classify communities? And in some ways, the classification based on morphology might work pretty well for macroorganisms, but for microorganisms, it doesn't work so well. And so rather than using that, we can use a gene, the 16S ribosomal gene, which is part of the protein-making apparatus and has been conserved in bacteria as a marker gene, one where we can go through and say, okay, who's, who's there? Can we go through and just use this one gene as a marker for the evolutionary lineage to try to understand what bacteria are there? And then... Um, and then classify those. And so the approach here is to design universal primers that are to the conserved region of this gene and to amplify those regions. And that would amplify from a DNA sample that we you know we take just a vaginal swab sample in my case and then extract everything. You have human DNA, bacterial DNA, all sorts of bacterial DNA. And then you amplify and it would only amplify but um, the bacterial DNA for this particular gene. And then use the variable regions to try to understand and classify what that looks like. And there's some, now there's some very good approaches for, for doing that sort of classification. And I'll talk about some of the more exciting methods that I think have, have more recently become available. So the basic idea is you start with this gene, you go through and amplify based on the conserved regions, and then you sequence the variable regions, and then use some sort of classification method. Um, the, the standard approaches have either been mapping to a reference database where you have a reference dependent sort of, of approach, which I think have particular, are particularly useful as we start thinking about clinical diagnostics, or some of the approaches that were, that were used where we go through and actually just think de novo from scratch. How do we compare all of the sequences to each other, figure out how many things we have, and then, and then classify the, the number of things after we've done that sorting. And then from there, however we do the classification, we can go downstream and start to think about what sort of analyses. And so in this case, you know, maybe there are two different groups or you have a case and a control and you wanna ask, are there differences and what are those differences? And so while this is a relatively mature technology, um, there are still quite a few challenges as we start to think about how do we move this towards translation? Um, one of those um, is in terms of classification. Um, a couple of years ago, um, um, uh, ben Callahan and Susan Holmes um, published a method um, using exact sequence variants rather than operational taxonomic units. Now, I know for those of you who aren't in the field, I found that a lot. But the idea here, and what, one of the things that was really interesting is that they used the quality information from the sequences rather than just the sequences that came off of the machine to be able to actually understand how can we go through and actually understand what are the exact sequences rather than just kind of rough rough units. And this is something that for, for those of you who are doing it, I would encourage you if you're using a, a de novo based approach to, to, to look at these methods. And one example of why that this sort of um, method was important, um, if the same group followed up on this and showed that they were able to find um, uh, this sort of a method, method allowed for an association of Gardnerella vaginalis, which is a vaginal organism to be a, in their study was associated with preterm birth but it wasn't for all Gardnerella. It was only for ones that had this particular variant. And so this sort of analysis allows that level of resolution and I think is, is quite exciting. So another, another area that I think is very, um, very exciting is looking at what sort of controls are needed, both positive controls and negative controls. Um, there's quite a big push in the community right now to encourage journals and authors to publish controls um, in, in addition to the samples. Um, one example that there's, there's been quite a controversy in the field over the, the papers that have come out over the placental microbiome. There was a, a, recent, a recent paper that just came out in Nature that suggests, and this is one, uh, one of, of several recent papers, that using negative controls 
the recent studies show a lack of support for a placental microbiome. So I think that's something that's really important um, in terms of experimental design and in terms of transparency and reporting is to make sure that controls are, are part of these sorts of experiments. There are a number of methods that are continuing to go on to look at um, how, what sorts of things can impact bias. Here's one looking at the GC content and there are others as well. Um, others in terms of what are the, what are the statistical uh, challenges with working with these kinds of data. So if we think about this, really, if you take, if you use this approach for 16S sequencing, everything that you're looking at is pretty much proportional. It, it's not necessarily, it doesn't tell you exactly how much bacteria is there. It tells you relatively how much bacteria is there, which means that there's the, the data is constrained in some ways. And that leads to some, some challenges. And the, the other part of that is that there, it's sparse. And that's just a fancy way of saying that there are lots of zeros. So there are lots of people who don't have a particular organism where one particular sample has that. And so those sorts of qualities of data um, present some unique challenges. And there's still quite a bit of exciting work going on in terms of what are the best statistical approaches to handle this type of data. And the other thing that's quite interesting is, is using technology to, to push this forward. So most of the studies that use 16S sequencing for microbiome surveys use just some of the variable region using short read sequencing. Um, but there've been some very exciting approaches using 16S using long reads, um, such as the using PacBio sequencing to get the full amplicon length, which is about 1500 bases, um, to, rather than just looking at one region. And I think this is particularly important as we start thinking about linking across studies. And I'll show one example of that. So as part of um, one of the, the studies that, that we just published in Nature Medicine um, this past June, um, I uh, did a, a meta-analysis of uh, several studies that have looked at the vaginal microbiome in preterm birth. Um, and this includes four, and these are four that had um, included a number of women of, of African ancestry. And you can see here that there are a lot of different uh, technical choices across the studies. Everyone used a different collection swab. Um, there were different hypervariable regions used. And even for the cases where there were different hypervariable regions, people had different primers, primer selection. And then on top of that, there's different sequencing technologies. So in terms of harmonization, there's certainly some opportunities for microbiome start studies to start thinking about, well, how do each of these choices impact the, the decisions? And when we see differences across studies, are there technological differences that are driving these or are there biological differences or differences in the experimental design? And I think there's a lot of room to be done in this area, especially as we think about um, clinically important results and how do we set up um, proper validation studies. Uh, one of the roles for, I think, the long read sequencing is that there are some cases where there are organisms that have never been cultivated, where we don't yet have a full length read that couples the V1 to V3 region, which are three hyper variable regions as part of the 16S gene, with one of the V4, for example. And so it's impossible to actually link the data between these studies. And that's something that I think um, there's quite a bit of opportunity there for trying to harmonize across studies using these sorts of data. So I'm going to switch gears a bit um, and move from some of the ideas of, of just who is in a community. And this is a lot of the work when there, there are a large number of, sample, of studies that are using 16S surveys to do that. Um, into what are they doing and how are they interacting with the host over time. And I would say that the next piece there would be to go through and take the same sort of sample type, and in that case, DNA from a, from a mixed community, and apply a different technology. So in this case, rather than just targeting one gene to use as a marker, essentially all of the, everything is sequenced. And so again, if that's a vaginal swab sample, it could have human DNA, viral DNA, bacterial, uh, bacterial phage DNA, um, microbial DNA, yeast DNA, all of that could be present. Um, and then there are lots of different questions that could be asked of that data. So metagenomics um, is the study of the collective genomes of a microbial community without the need for isolating or culturing, cultivating that in the lab. So if we take this and we apply short read sequencing, I like to think about this as we went to the toy star store and went to the puzzle aisle and took lots of different numbers of 5,000 piece puzzles, dumped them out onto the ground, and then threw the box lids away so that you don't actually know what you're looking for. Um, and so the approaches that we have in this area, I think there's still a lot of room for development. 
Um, one approach would be to try to assemble that. And that would just be starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together to see how far you can come. There might be cases where you can't go any further, but you can go through and start to do that. Uh, the other approach would to say, well, maybe you don't have the exact box lib, but maybe you have a relatively good reference sequence. And you could st start using that reference to go through and, and map the reads to a reference approach. Um, and the other, the other piece would be to go through and do something with the, the reads directly. And I think the approach for what you do with this sort of data really depends on what the question is. So are you asking just who's there? Are you using this as a way to validate what was found in the 16S survey data? Are you looking to classify broad functional categories of how many genes are associated with carbohydrate utilization? And does that differ between you know, your, your cases and your controls and your particular study design? Are you interested in strain level comparison? And so that might be interesting. Um, some of the questions that, that my group is asking in terms of how do moms pass their organisms to their infants, certainly asking, is it the same organism? Uh, that, that sort of thing is, is, quite, is quite interesting. Or maybe you're just interested in a particular class of genes. So I'll give one example here of antimicrobial resistance genes. And in that case, you don't care about the rest of it. You're just going in and trying to find particular class of genes and, and pulling those out. So as you can see, even despite the fact that this is one technology, the types of approaches and the types of questions that can be asked of these data you know, are, are really endless. One of the other um, directions that I think is really interesting here is rather than just work on informatic techniques to make it possible to ask new questions, the other is to go through and use new technologies to, to be able to do the same. And so uh, some time back, I um, was actually putting together a reference database for a, a vaginal 16S reference database. And I came across a new organism that um, no one had, had reported before, but it was associated with a common sexually transmitted infection called trichomoniasis. And it was associated with symptoms. And so we couldn't cultivate the organism. And so in this case, this was before, before the long read sequencing um, was available. And so we used the old 454 Roche platform to go through and sequence, um, sequence some examples where there were high abundance of this particular organism. And a number of technicians in my group um, went through and actually closed all of the gaps using standard approaches with PCRing over those to go through and get a full, a full circular genome. And this was quite exciting. And one of the results that came out of the preterm birth publication that I just talked with you about also included organisms that hadn't been cultivated. And um, this, this was something that I was, again, we couldn't cultivate some of these organisms. And so the question is, well, how do you move forward? How do you try to understand something about an organism about which we only know a 16S sequence? And then in this case, it was early in pregnancy. Uh, it differentiated the women who went on to deliver preterm from those who did not, at least in this proof of principle study. Um, so we were really interested in, in trying to understand that. And so in this case, um, I partnered with Jonas Kurlock at um, Pacific Biosciences and his team. And I had samples that were not ideal. They were relatively low biomass. They had been sheared because in the case of the human microbiome samples, we use bead beating approaches because it, it's found that if you go through and you use bead beating approaches, you actually can go through and break open cells that you might not otherwise break open. And, in, and if you're interested in just what's there, that's really important because we want to make sure that we, we see everything and we don't introduce bias in that sort of way. But if you're trying to get long reads, uh, this approach also tends to shear the DNA. And so these samples were not ideal for this approach, but uh, we were able to go through and get um, a new Saccharobacteria, um, Saccharobacteria organism from TM7H1, which is our provisional name for this new organism that belongs to a newly named phylum in two contigs, which was quite easy to circularize. And so that I think is a, a really exciting new approach to think about how metagenomics could be paired where there is metagenomics for looking for the development of new reference databases um, you know, and paired with, with either cultivation or from selected samples to really supplement a lot of the, the data that is being generated using short reads. So if we go back to our, our omics slide and we think about what's kind of next along the, um, the route of omics, you might think it's a pretty easy to go from what's there from the DNA perspective to what's actually being transcribed. 
So this is what we call meta transcriptomics. And so again, in this case, it's a very similar sort of, of, of technique. So if we, if we again, we have a vaginal swab sample. And in this case, rather than extracting DNA, we extract RNA and actually understand what genes are, are, have been turned on. And then we could go through and do the sim same similar sorts of bioinformatics analyses using that, sorts of, that sort of data. And so here's from, from another group. One of the simple things that you can ask is, well, do you get the same composition if you use a 16S survey to find out who's there? Or if you just go through and you map the transcripts to the organisms that you know, do you get the same survey? And in some cases, you can see that at the, at the uh, transcript level, there's some organisms that have many more transcripts, which might mean that they're more transcriptionally active. And then if you go down to the, to the gene level, um, I think it's, it's quite interesting because there are a lot of different things that you could do. And this is just a, kind of, I'm scratching the surface here, just to kind of get, give you a sense of the types of things that can be done and how you frame the question and how that matters. And so one of the things that we did uh, recently with the, the preterm birth data set was we normalized using a global scaling approach. And that means we mapped the transcripts to a database that we have, that we curated for vaginal organisms. And then um, from there, um, we asked the question, uh, are they up or down in preterm or term birth if we divide by all of the genes that were from the, the, their entire mapping file? And that, that basically gives us a way to ask the same question is, are there particular things at the transcript level that are up in term or up in preterm birth? And for this, it really gave us a way to validate some of the um, findings that we found using the Amplicon data. And then you could think that you could move beyond that, from beyond just at the transcript level, do you still see more of a particular organism that, that are associated with, with one particular condition? Um, if you pair this sort of data with metagenomics data that are, that are analyzed in a very similar fashion, where you take the DNA samples, uh, at the, the metagenome data, and you map that to a database, and then you take a paired sample that was collected at the same time, and you take the metatranscriptome data, and you map that to the same database, you could ask, well, if you divide the proportional abundance based on one to the other, you can actually start to ask if there's a difference in the relative transcriptional activity of a particular taxon in one group compared to the other. And one of the things that we found is, which I've talked about this organism a couple of times, is there, there was a difference in Gardnerella vaginalis in the transcriptional activity of the women who went on to experience spontaneous preterm birth. And another group, and in this, this was actually a study of, of uh, metronidazole, which is an antibiotic that's often used to treat imbalance in the vaginal microbiome. And this group used a taxon-specific scaling approach. So rather than dividing by all of the genes, they just looked at the ones in Gardnerella and asked of the Gardnerella genes that were present, are there particular genes that were up or down in a particular condition? And that um, made it possible for them to, um, to, to find that there were a specific group of genes that were that were upregulated um, compared to the other um, in, in this in this um, study, and so I think the, I think the thing that's really important to think about here is that there are a lot of different ways to do the analysis from the same sort of data set, and there are a lot of opportunities for those of you who might be interested in method development to develop new methods to increase the rigor in, in, in these areas, particularly as we move along from 16S into some of the other omics technologies where we move to more discovery-based science, there's a really a lot of opportunity in the method development, both from how do you understand new, new features that are important to look at, and then how do we handle the underlying statistics to improve rigor in, these, in, in this area. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just go through the metaproteomics and metabolomics very quickly, and I'll just give a couple of of examples, but there's some a lot of really interesting studies that are going on in these areas as well. So this was a really interesting study um, looking at HIV tenofovir uh, treatment in African women. And uh, this was a group that used, here you'll see a, a, a profile here looking at what tax taxonomically is present. And this looks very similar to some of the data that you might see um, from 16S data, but this was used, um, it, this was actually done using the proteome, which I think is quite interesting. And there are a lot of really interesting ways that we could start thinking about coupling the proteome to the transcriptome to the metagenome all the way back to the surveys. And I think that's, that's quite an interesting area. And here's one example of metabolomics that was used to, to stratify different subtypes of bacterial vaginosis, which is the most common in bacterial imbalance 
um, that is clinically diagnosed. Um, and you can see here that um, women who are negative or positive for the bacterial vaginosis status uh, using a hierarchical clustering um, technique, um, this group found that there were multiple subtypes. And I think that's something inter that's really interesting to think about. What are the different groups of microbial communities that might be responsible for different metabolites? And, and how does this all fit together as a system? And so I think that brings us to how do we bring it all together? How do we go through and take all of this really rich data that is now being uh, generated using these really cool new multi-omic methods? And how do we bring it all together to make sense of all of that? I'll give a couple of examples of some of the, the types of things that are happening, but I think this is an area where it's just, it's just a really exciting area that's moving very rapidly. And so one common approach um, would be to go through and look at one data type and then layer others on. So you could see here, uh, this is actually a, a study where the clustering is actually done based on immune, um, the immune response and then the, um, the other types, including uh, measures of the, the microbiome are kind of layered on top of that. And that's one sort of approach that's been classical, that's been used and has been useful in terms of driving results forward. Um, uh, David Edwards, who's part of the group at BCU, has been exploring um, using a method called sparse canonical correlation analysis. Um, since I know not all of you are statisticians, I won't go into too many of the details here, but there's a lot of work that's going on about how do you take different omics me measures that have really different features. So I talked earlier about the fact that the 16S compositional data tends to be sparse. So there are lots of zeros, meaning a lot of samples don't have some of the things that are found. And it's proportional, meaning it's constrained. And how do you integrate that with a different data type that has a very different, different sorts of properties? And there's a lot of opportunities, I think, from the statistics level, in addition to kind of the upstream informatics level so that we can understand how we can put this together in terms of linking together the different functional features that we're, that we're talking about. And I think that's quite exciting. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll mention is that the resources that um, I talked about for the Moms BI project, in addition to the other two projects that were part of the HMP are all publicly available. Um, you can go to the HMP DAC, I've listed the website here and you can download that directly. And a colleague of mine has also put together an R package for any of you who may be um, R users um, to pull down the feature data. So if you'd rather not reanalyze all of the upstream raw data from scratch, but you are interested in an easy to use R package, um, I suggest that that might be one that you would want to take a look at as well. And I think the, I talked about this earlier as really the challenges in multi omic microbiome science, but I would say that these are also quite a bit of opportunities and they really differ. So if we're thinking about the, what are the challenges and what are the opportunities when we are really pushing the frontiers of what we can currently do, uh, those are, are really opportunities where we could think about new informatic methods to, to identify features that have never been identified before from some of these data types. Um, and then as we start to think about some of the technologies that are becoming a bit more mature, how do we, in, in, how do we increase rigor? How do we make sure that we are including proper positive and negative controls? How do we make sure that we're understanding the sorts of bias? How do we make sure that we're able to harmonize across different studies so that we can, we can understand if we look at the literature, um, whether or not uh, there's, there's good evidence that we should move forward and, and invest in a particular area. And so I think that the opportunities um, in this area moving forward really depend on where things are in the maturity of, of the, um, of the technology and in terms of the, the analytical methods. And so I'm gonna bring things back to, to some of the things that I care about. Um, I mentioned that I'm certainly very interested in the, the vaginal microbiome. And I think if we think about the fact that there are signatures in the vaginal microbiome that are linked to preterm birth, um, I'd like to think about in the, how in the future we may be able to use these approaches to ultimately test to assess risk and then understand the underlying mechanisms enough so that we might use personalized treatments to promote health in pregnancy. And if you have any questions, um, my email address will be available um, and you can email me and contact me and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So thanks so much and I really appreciate all of your time.